Praise the Lord. I thank God for giving me another opportunity to stand before you all with the word of God. As, as you all know, we are working our way through our new series, uh, which is the New and Living Way. Uh, we spoke about kind of the background of how we were depraved and corrupted by sin and how Christ redeemed us and brought us under this new covenant. We um, experienced a new birth. God gave us a new heart. And we are, if you can actually go to the next slide, um, and you can see we are now um, talking about the new fruit. And Minu gave us an introduction last week about uh, that topic and uh, really spent some time on what that means. So essentially, when we are in this new and living way, with a new heart that God has given us, God is expecting this new fruit from us in our Christian living. And uh, I really enjoyed the example that uh, Minu gave, uh, which is what Jesus spoke, uh, really centralized based on uh, Jesus' uh, message in John chapter 15, how he is a new, uh, he is a true vine, and we are the branches that shoot forth from that new vine, as, just like as he referenced uh, in Isaiah, where it says that out of the root of Jesse, a new branch shall spring forth, right? So Jesus is that new branch uh, or new vine that came out of the root of Jesse, right? In the lineage of David, and we are the branches that came off of that new vine. Again, as it says in Romans 9, uh, so we should remember that uh, many reminded us of this that we don't hold up the tree or the root uh, but the root bears us so before we get proud and arrogant uh, understand that we are born up or upheld by the root that is Christ and not the other way around right amen all right so moving on to that so, if, so I'm going to uh, so many have set it up a little bit. I'm going to go a little bit further into that and then we'll cover the nine uh, aspects of the fruit of the Spirit. And as he reminded, fruit of the Spirit, when it's mentioned as a singular, it's not fruits of the Spirit, but rather fruit of the Spirit in singular. And there's a reason for that. So if you go to the next slide, I will try to explain that before I go into my topic. So. So we all know the passage in Galatians 5.22 where it describes the fruit of the Spirit which we, are, we memorize when we're from a young age. Uh, love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, and self-control. Um, one thing we have to understand is that um, those are, as we understand it, is grouped into three categories each. So love, joy, peace, which I will discuss, uh, are one type or one set of the nine fruit of the Spirit. And then there's patience, gentleness, goodness, which we'll cover next time. And then finally, faithfulness, meekness, and self-control. So, but how I look at this is why we say it's one fruit. It's that God is desiring us to exhibit all nine components of this one fruit and how we can look at this and we can use other fruits as examples like oranges or, or uh, whatever fruit that have pieces to it but pomegranate is one that is in the Bible uh, throughout and I thought it was a perfect example to display uh, this concept is so just like the pomegranate is one fruit but multiple seeds within it right a seed with uh, covered in flesh that we can eat uh, that's what the fruit of the spirit means so if you remember back uh, when i spoke about the new birth experience uh, that is not so what happens when we are born again is that christ himself is implanted within us right and intertwines with our spirit which is raised from the dead and 
to create a new creation within us, right? So we become a new creation in Christ. So this new creation, as it grows and matures, bears this fruit, which is the nature of God. So all of the, the nature of God is encompassed or fulfilled and wrapped up in this one fruit, which has nine different, as it, uh, it's uh, it described in Galatians 5.22, has nine aspects or components, whatever you want to call it, but it's not like God, if we mature in Christ, it's not like some people have self-control, but they don't have love. Or some people have faithfulness, but they don't have peace. But as we mature in Christ, we exhibit all of these nine parts of this one fruit. You all with me? And this actually is embedded throughout the Bible, this concept. God speaks in many places, in Isaiah, in Hosea. He talks about a vineyard. I will bring my beloved to a vineyard, you know, an enclosed garden, where he fertilizes and nourishes the garden that produces much fruit. In fact, uh, if you look at, uh, so this pomegranate, uh, the reason I picked it, is that if you look at the priestly garment, on the hem of the garment, uh, Aaron was instruct, uh, or the Israelites were instru uh, Moses was instructed to put uh, alternating pomegranates and bells, which is a very interesting um, thing to put on the bottom of your clothes. Just imagine maybe that trend will come at some point, but if you just dangle, you know, images of pomegranates uh, or a bell alternating at the bottom of your pants or a skirt or whatever, right? And you're walking and you're ringing a bell and you can see these pomegranates dangling, right? So I believe that symbolizes, a, uh, and I think different people say what those are, but I believe that the pomegranates symbolize the fruit of the spirit that a Christian uh, exhibits under the new covenant, which is the nature of God, which is all of these aspects of God that come forth from us from the inside out, as we mature in Christ. You all with me? As Christ grows in us day after day, as His Word overflows from us, we exhibit love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, goodness, all these things. Uh, I, uh, just a side note, I believe the bells represent the works that we do through Christ, or the gifts of the Spirit. Right, all of those. So the fruit and the gifts of the spirit are an important aspect of our spiritual life. But the pomegranate, the fruit, are through are shown throughout. And one example you can see in Song of Solomon's. I will read uh, chapter four, verse twelve and thirteen. You'll see a garden enclosed is my sister, my spouse. A spring shut up, a fountain sealed. Thy plants are an orchard of pomegranates with pleasant fruits, camphor with spikenard. Uh, if I go on uh, in verse 16, let my beloved come into his garden and eat his pleasant fruits. Again in chapter 6 uh, of Song of Solomon, you'll see verse 11. I went down to the garden of nuts to see the fruits of the valley. And to see whether the vine flourished and the pomegranates budded. Uh, verse, chapter 7 verse um, 11 says, Come my beloved, let us go forth into the field, let us lodge in the villages, let us get up early to the vineyards, let us see the vine flourish, whether the tender grape appear and the pomegranates bud forth. There will I give thee my loves. So if you see Song of Solomon, if you read, spend time just meditating on Song of Solomon, read it, you know, it's easy to take away from a kind of a, you know, a superficial reading. It's easy to take away as just an example of a love between a man and a woman. But if you look behind the spiritual meaning of that, it really shows the, the love, the, the endless love between Christ and His church. And you cannot get away from reading that, uh, that book without seeing how much longing 
and desire the beloved had uh, uh, they had for each other. You know, so the man and the woman, or the church and the Christ, uh, Christ and the church, have, this is just a shadow of the relationship between the Christ and the church. Is that same desire, that the depth of the unending love and longing for each other, when they were separated within that book, you can see when they were separated, they were longing for the next time that they will be with each other. So all of these things are just pointing to or a shadow of our love and longing and our relationship with Christ. So one aspect is of what God expects from us is shown by what we just read is that our relationship is not fruitless. The whole reason that God called us into this covenant the whole reason that he shed his blood for us, the whole reason that he came to die on the cross and brought us into this way is so that we will bear fruit and much fruit. And by that I mean he wants to see his nature, the way he loved us, the way he uh, is gentle and kind and good, the way he is, he wants us to be transformed into that same nature. This is the whole reason he brought us into this way. It is not for any other reason that we might hear about when we share the gospel. Or we hear about the gospel. It is not about to make our life in this world uh, better or improved or make us feel good about ourselves. It is so that we might bear fruit for him. You all with me? And so that is represented by these pomegranates, these wonderful fruit that is, if you scientifically you look at, you can see it's a superfood almost, has so many nutrients and antioxidants and all these good things. But with the spiritual meaning is, it's, I mean, some people actually even say there are exactly 613 seeds, which there are exactly 613 laws. I don't know if that's true because I think there's, varying number of seeds within a pomegranate but uh, but either way <clears throat> all of these things show the fruit of the spirit so now going uh, one more step before I go into my topic is so the three groupings I mentioned earlier the nine fruit of the spirit I want us to understand this clearly so love joy peace the first three speak to uh, the, our internal condition who we are as people you know, inside, if somebody cuts us open and looks into our heart, or as God sees in our heart, is he going to see love, joy, and peace? Is that the condition of our heart? Uh, what we're overflowing with? Our, the first step. The second component is patience, gentleness, and goodness. And we'll expand on that in the coming weeks. But it's how we deal with other people. Are we patient and long-suffering? Are we gentle and good and kind with other people? The last three speak to our conduct. Are we faithful? Are we meek? And do we have self-control? So all of these things have specific meaning. And I'm going to go a step further. It's just my interpretation. Is the pomegranates on, on the hem of the priest's garment or three different uh, colors. I think it was blue, purple, and I forgot the third one. But I believe it could imply these three categories of types of fruit of the fruit of the spirit so but either way the point is all of these things together are what God is expecting just like what we read beloved let's go see into the garden did the vine produce pomegranates as we are going forward in our Christian journey year after year decade after decade if God looks down, comes down into the vineyard and examines us, is he going to see this nature in us? Or is he going to see the same Christian that we were when we were first born again? Or is he going to see no growth in us when he looks at our love or our joy and all of these things? That's what he's wanting to see. That's why he says, let us go into the vineyard. Let us examine, that's what gives him pleasure, is when we produce fruit, when he produces nature within us, when we 
become like him. That's what gives him joy and pleasure within our relationship. Yes, he wants to give us things when we pray. You know, he wants to answer our prayer and give us all the things that we desire according to his will. But what really gives him joy in, within our relationship with him is us producing much fruit. I'll say one more thing and I'll move on. Well, you know, man judges by gifts, right? But when we look at other people, we look at people with, you know, speaking in tongues or prophesying, all of those are important. But we judge people based on what their gifts are, outward things, the bells on the priest's garment. But God judges us on the fruit. He doesn't look at our Christianity and say, oh, he doesn't, uh, you know, prophesy, or so he's not spiritual. No. It clear, the Bible clearly says that God judges us based on the fruit that we produce. That's why in John 15 he says, you know, the branches that don't produce any fruit are cut off and cast aside to be burnt. So let us worry ourselves if, whether we're producing the fruit that God desires or not, while still desiring the gift of the Spirit. I'm not saying those are not important, but I'm just saying God, just like in the Song of Solomon, is looking to see if we're producing the fruit of his nature. Are we loving like Christ loved us? That is a central question we have to ask uh, ourselves constantly. Constantly. Okay, so moving on to the next slide. So now I'll come to, uh, real quick, um, and uh, <clears throat> I'll just read uh, Galatians chapter 5, 16, uh, Onwards, just a few verses. Uh, this I say then, walk in the spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. For the lust, flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. These are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. But if you be led of the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulation, wrath, strife. Uh, I'm going to keep going, moving forward. Um, and then verse 22, but for the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. And we've already discussed those. So what Paul is saying is, there's a distinction between what when you live in your flesh, what the fruit those, that kind of living produces, and when you live in the spirit, what that type of living produces. Okay, so we, if you remember, we've kind of shared this graphic a few times. You know, we are made up of three components, body, soul, and spirit. When we're made alive in Christ, our spirit, which is a yellow, is made alive, right? We are a new creation. We are connected to the spirit of God who indwells within us. But we still have a soul which has mind, emotions, and will. And then we have an outward body, right? So when we allow our soul or our flesh to reign within us, then the fruit that comes out of it, right? What you see externally, the actions that we do, are these things that we see, which is idolatry, adultery, sexual immorality, all of these things are fruit of letting the flesh control our lives, which is living by what pleases our mind, our emotions, our will. You all with me? It is so important to understand this because we focus on the outward uh, fruit or actions and we judge people but or judge ourselves, but really you have to go down to what that was driven by. It's allowing our flesh to dictate or control our life. Versus allowing the spirit to lead us to grow spiritually into the nature of Christ. That's what Paul is saying. It's two separate things. If you allow your spirit, flesh to reign and you are living day in and day out under what pleases your flesh. Under what makes you happy temporarily. What gives you pleasure in this world then it's going to produce all these different works like adultery and sexual immorality, all these things. And so then I'll take the first three things, which is love, joy, peace, which is my topic for today. So then 
when we are living in the flesh and these works are made from us, then we focus on a worldly love, a worldly joy, and a worldly peace. That means it's a superficial. We are, you know, our life is up and down temporarily based on a, a worldly uh, love, which is not God's agape love. We love based on how it suits us. We love others based on the nature of what they did to us, not what God, how God loved us. We love people based on who is good to us, who is beneficial to us, and who has not harmed us. And when those are up and down or people betray us, we are up and down with that fluctuation. The same way with joy. When we think, you know, uh, the things of this world are going against us, you know, we lose things or we don't get the things that we, don't, we want. And then we are, we are constantly fluctuating in our inner selves, in our inner condition, our confidence. And even as Christians, we let our joy or our happiness be up and down because it's superficial. Because it's not rooted in a joy that is in Christ. It's because we are letting our flesh drive our life forward. You all with me? Can you say amen to that? Amen. amen. All right. So the third thing is peace. When we, things go wrong, you know, we are shaken, we are disturbed, we are anxious. We cannot have a, fo a focus because things did not go our way. You know, you know, we look at the world today. There's so many things to be to lose our peace over. We, you know, there's, uh, you know, if you think, hear the news today about the shootings, all the various sicknesses that are abounding, we can easily lose our peace or our joy if you let the flesh drive our life. You all with me? But this is not the love, joy, peace that is the fruit of the spirit. It is just a superficial thing. It doesn't mean that we are not impacted by uh, people hurting us in our relationships. It doesn't mean that we're not impacted by you know, sickness or uh, job loss or terrible news that uh, shakes us. Is it not Do we not live in this world? Are we not shaken by the, uh, the wickedness that abounds in society? Do we lose our, temporarily lose our peace over those things? Absolutely. We are impacted by those things. We live in this world ourselves. Right? But those should be momentary changes versus the controlling factors that drive our life. What we, when we say love, uh, joy, uh, so before I go to that, that's why God is warning the Israelites. You know, because you serve, you didn't serve God with joyfulness and with gladness of heart because of all the abundance of things that we have. If you look at today's society, we are so driven by what we don't have. And we lose our peace and joy and we're, we have so much anxiety about our looks, our the possessions, uh, our whatever we don't have, we lose our peace over those things. And, we, and the popular culture or social media, all these things feed into those anxieties and they impact our relationship with God and with each other. Sometimes God is asking us to extricate ourselves. Uh, remove ourselves from the things that drive this behavior. And let us abandon the things that cause us to lose our true joy and true peace in Christ. You all with me? Okay, so if you move to the next slide, um, but what does it mean to have this fruit of the Spirit in Christ? And I'm way behind my time. Um, so love, joy, peace. So when you talk about love, it is the love of God that was the only example, the primary example that you can see is Christ's love that was on the cross. There was no reason that he should die for me, a sinner. There was no reason that he should die for us, we who were enemies of the cross. 
but the same love that he showed or poured out freely for us on the cross willingly that same love is the love that God desires to be exhibited in us or produce in us so that we may love people not because of how they treat us not because whether they backstab us or or benefit us but love people and love God in the same way he showed his love towards us and this is the selfless love of Christ that he showed on the cross there is no more perfect example than the love that was displayed on the cross that we can use to say this is the fruit of the spirit that's why in 1st Corinthians it talks about uh, you know love does not what puff itself up love does not uh, seek its own love does not harm of any of those things that's why Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount love your enemies because he did just that what kind of worldly love would ask you to do that to love your enemies have we ever heard such a saying what do you mean love my enemies you want me to love this person that uh, did this wicked thing to me yes that's what God did that's what God did for us joy this joy that is uh, I'm not I'm not it's not talking about the uh, the uh, the superficial uh, transient you know happiness that comes and goes yes we 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 fluctuate in our emotions but this is not uh, you know the soul you know we talk about will emotions right the soul or the three components of the soul this is not talking about our emotions or a or a fleshly level of joy but this is a joy that runs deep that draws from the deep well of salvation when we think about the joy of salvation that how we were in that pit that we have no hope of getting out and that God set our feet upon a rock washed us with his own blood the joy that overflows our heart that is unspeakable undescribable this joy is what we should drive our hearts overflow from our hearts and finally the peace the, as Paul says in Philippians the peace that passes all understanding sure we might lose our peace when we hear bad news or shocking uh, things around the world or, or things that you know we might lose our job or or we have sickness or loved ones are suffering that it takes our peace but you look at the tree in Psalm 1 it's planted by the waters the seasons come and go but the tree grows stronger and stronger it's tranquility and unwavering trust in God this peace cannot be taken away as we grow deeper and deeper in our relationship with Christ and he in fact as Minu said he allows us to suffer the loss of things so that we may learn this peace and joy and love so in this internal condition of ourselves our spiritual state is what is talking about the fruit of the spirit this love joy and peace if God cuts us open what is he going to see this turbulence or this love joy and peace what is he going to see when he looks inside our heart is, is, is he going to see dissatisfaction or murmuring or complaint just like the Israelites or is he going to be seeing the overflowing joy of salvation Drip, drinking from the deep well that is offered at, from Christ amen you all with me yes uh, I'll go to the last slide I invite the worship team to come forward uh, the last slide um, it really comes back to the can you go to the last slide um, it comes back to I mean one thing we have to understand we cannot uh, produce the fruit ourselves just like we can't force a tree to produce fruit but as a tree is in its nature to produce fruit the tree nobody has to tell the tree to produce a fruit 
right? It's in its nature. But what is important is it needs a right environment. You all with me? It needs fertilizer. It needs constant watering. It needs sunlight. So this is what produces a fruit. So if we're constantly immersing ourselves in an environment that is designed for the flesh to thrive, for us to constantly lust after all the things that are flesh desires. If we're constantly placing ourselves in an environment that really feeds on that nature, we can't expect the nature of God to flow or outflow from us. You all with me? We have to, just like a tree, a pomegranate tree, for it to produce fruit, it needs the word of God as a fertilizer. The flow of the Spirit, it needs our quiet time to allow God to commune with us, shut out the things that distract us, allow God to transform us day after day, month after month, year after year. It needs fellowship with other believers. It needs, you know, the things that we do, outwardly working out our salvation. It needs all of these things working together that without our knowing, we are transformed into the nature of God. Then we will exhibit this pomegranate fruit is interesting because when it gets so ripe, it bursts forth with this hard uh, flesh, just rips open and the fruit kind of just flows out of it, the seed. It's just like us when the love of God and the joy and peace of God overflow from us. It rips open the outer shell, the hardened shell that we have and flows out from us that people look at it and say, Wow, can you see the love of God in that person? Can you see the joy that flows out from that person, the peace of God that flows from it? But it also involves being crucified with Christ. Now what that means that is in verse 24 of Galatians chapter 5. There that of Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and the lusts. If we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. So this is the same thing that Christ did on the cross. He willingly laid himself down. Could he have asked his angels to come and save him at that moment? Yes. But he willingly spread his hands to be nailed and his feet to be nailed. This is the same expectation. It is not feel good to give up the things that is a hindrance between us and God. But God is asking us to crucify our affections, the things we would rather do in our natural or normal state. If that is a hindrance between you and God, it is a hindrance from bearing fruit for Him. He's asking us to lay down on that cross and to be nailed to that cross. So that He can boldly say as Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. It is yet no longer that I live, but Christ who lives within me. This is what produces a fruit. This is what produces a love, joy, peace, and all the fruit of the Spirit within us as we mature in our relationship with Christ. May His name be glorified.